Hello everyone, Darzo McGarzo here. Welcome to Darren McGarvey's comment, people. Um, in the real world right now, uh, unlike royalty, where most of you don't have the six point six billion acres of land to fall back on, uh, the only thing currently standing between you and the jaws of corporate tyranny is uh, Gary Lineker and Carol Vorderman. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We have uh, bouncers on the doors of some Scott mids, security tags on cheese slices. We've got more uh, food banks than McDonald's restaurants, all while a billionaire class enters a new space race. And no politician has yet thought to tax these fuckers uh, upon re-entry. Do you remember when uh, we were constantly being told that Britain was the fastest growing economy in the G7. Well, it seems like some expectation management has occurred. Yeah. So now we're the only economy in the G7 that's not growing. And we're being constantly reassured by a pulsating hive of highly networked, privately educated bullshitters, bullies, and tax avoiders that actually... Uh, we really actually need low wages to deal with poverty. We really actually need maybe a recession to deal with inflation. And that if only you, stinky, little, servile, spineless plebs, would just give it up with the Netflix subscriptions and the cappuccinos and whatever remains of your already abysmal daily hygiene regimens, then you too could one day save up enough pennies for a deposit, for a home, thus leaving your children somewhere to freeze and starve once you've blown your own fucking brains out in a nearby wooded area. It's a difficult time, folks. The only silver lining on this storm cloud surely has to be energy prices are now so high that our leaders can only afford to gaslight us for another three months. That's my wee rant over. Today I want to talk about trauma, I want to talk about some of the effects of trauma, how it might manifest in our behaviour, in our self-image, and how actually sometimes we might think that we're recovering from trauma, or that we're engaging in behaviour that will help us to cathartically move through trauma, particularly when we use social media uh, to share our stories, uh, that actually we might be prolonging uh, the adverse effects that we've experienced earlier in our lives and that we might not be placing ourselves on the surest possible footing uh, to, to not only recover from the trauma but to get a, a true picture and me proper meaning of what that experience was all about and how we move on with our lives. So now I'm just going to show you a little clip from a documentary film that I've seen previewed on social media called Nymphomaniac and it seems uh, to be about exploring uh, what some might regard as sexual promiscuity, people who, who have a kind of um, a big appetite for sexual experiences. And it's an interview with a woman who's sharing some of her experience. It's a title that's gonna be anywhere. I'm not sure we should talk about that. <laughs> I mean, a, sec a female subject is actually called a, a niptoe. Yeah, I've been called niptoe before. I don't know if I am or not, if I have a call them. So you actually flew in last night, but your first person meeting was it was a guy that you arranged to meet? Yeah. And so I had somewhere to stay tonight. So you spent the night with him? Yeah. Where'd you meet him? Bet. I just made a post. I came going to LA who oh. I had all kinds of messages. Just online hookup up, hook up thing? Yeah. And how often do you do that? Flying out? I've only flown out once or twice, but till now. But, but like, in your in your typical. Probably new dicks. I don't know. Like for a week that I don't have Aubrey, I might have sex. Ten times, or more, and usually new people are. I don't know. 
couple at least. So it's like twice a day. Yeah. Or like a few guys at once or something. Oh, is that right? And this started how soon for you? What, what, how old were you when? Um, I started. So when I actually consentingly started doing this, teenager of some age. So I was really vanilla for a long time. And then I just, I always like getting snacks and shit. And so here we are. How old are you now? Uh, 34. 34. And you, you enjoy sex? Love sex. You love it? Love sex. Yes, usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. And are, have you had committed relationships before? Mm -hmm. I was in a relationship for nine years with my daughter's father. Um, and then a few years with my ex and, and, and that, that was, you were also doing things on the side. No, no, um, I was committed. I was just us. So that was, I guess, in some ways, a very interesting clip in the sense of here you have a woman who feels on some sense, sexually liberated on some sense, free and courageous enough to, to share some of their experience. And I guess, you know, that can be a positive thing. But also within that clip, there are a few clues uh, that the the woman in question might be operating from a place of trauma and that actually sharing details of your personal life, particularly intimate details on such a public forum, it could actually place you in a, in a place of, of, of more vulnerability in the long run. So I'm not casting any aspersions on this particular person. I wish them well. I, I left a comment actually under the video uh, when I seen it outlining some of my thoughts, which I'll uh, enlarge upon here. So the first clue that we're dealing with someone who has experienced trauma is that uh, she alludes to uh, her early sexual experiences. And you get a sense from the clip that these early sexual experiences or experience uh, were not consented to. So there is some aspect of sexual abuse early in life at play. Now, while I don't have all the scientific data to hand, I know that an adverse experience early in life uh, is a predictor for certain behaviors later in life. And that often the adverse experience sexually, particularly for for women and girls, uh, can lead to hypersexual behavior later on. Now, that's not always the case for everyone, but I think in this particular instance, the woman is in a film called Nymphomaniac, and so that has been the case here. Now, this discussion is occurring in a place where we celebrate that women feel freer to be open uh, about their sexuality, where they feel freer to be positive about their bodies, and uh, to engage in uh, sex work and to, to make a living from the, the, the male demand for that kind of spectacle, for that kind of stimulus. But obviously, we can run into potential areas of sensitivity where we might have people who have experienced trauma early in life, maybe don't necessarily have a full insight into how that drives their behavior and, uh, and subsequently end up in a documentary talking very openly about their experiences and uh, and in and, and my view perhaps maybe even at danger of oversharing. Now oversharing I believe is also a trauma response and uh, I'm, I'm a prolific oversharer. Uh, I'm a bit more careful in the details that I share now. I don't act on impulse to overshare but for me it was a big issue in the early days, one, because I had no sense of the potential audience that was out there and how many people would actually hear uh, these details of my life that I was revealing. Um, but also, uh, I didn't realise that part of my motivation for oversharing was because I was operating from a place of shame. I was operating from a place of fear. I was operating on the assumption that I was a deeply bad person, a broken person, an unlovable person. And so I think subconsciously what the oversharing was in an attempt to do was to offer more and more information to people who might be coming to some sort of judgment about me and trying to make sure that they had 
all of the information so that they could come to the most accurate possible assessment of me. And I guess underneath all of that was my hope that they would have enough pieces of the puzzle to put together so that they could see that actually I was a good person, that I was a nice person. What I didn't bank on was that actually every single overshare would then lead to a need to subsequently overshare more because there's always going to be some person who, no matter how many pieces of the picture they've got, uh, makes some kind of demand for more information, whether that be a direct request or whether it be implicit in the assumption that they make of the information that you have given them. So why did you not this and why did you not that? Now, if you're in an oversharing place and operating from a place of trauma, then your first instinct is to rush out and clarify for that person the thing that you think they've got wrong because you don't want them to draw the wrong conclusion about you. And so you can get kind of trapped in your own self-portrait in a sense where uh, you start to gain a sense of fleeting catharsis you start to gain a sense of fleeting validation and that this might then set you up to prime you, to continue to overshare aspects of your life which could potentially scandalise you, which could potentially ruffle the feathers of people around you who are connected to you and who also shared in some of these experiences or have different interpretations of these experiences and that this can unsettle people because not everyone is comfortable with that level of openness and everyone is within their rights to, to have any attitude towards that that, that is, is for them. Another thing uh, that I, I noticed from this video as well is um, we have a culture which has increasingly been more open about sexual proclivities, sexual tastes, sexual desire, um, kinks, fetishes. And one thing that I have observed in my life, whether from myself or through people that I know, is that sometimes when you come from a place of trauma early in life, whether it's sexual or whether it's uh, not sexual, it could be related around many things. It could be related around being humiliated. It could be related around being abandoned or betrayed. Uh, I've noticed that often a way of integrating the trauma and processing the trauma is for it to become, uh, in some ways, a kind of sexual fetish in some way. And that happens in, uh, with a lot of people. And there's this kind of fine line between trauma and experiences which were negative and painful and erotica and kink or fetish or whatever language you choose to use for it. But sometimes that can become unhealthy. It can become an obsession. It can become the sort of thing that isn't just a kind of rare indulgence, but actually something that you come to depend on and something that can kind of obsessively dominate your, your horizons where intimacy is concerned and can prevent you from achieving true intimacy, which is something that I myself have struggled with at different points, and I don't mind saying that. And so I think that this video, although it's just a short clip and I would have to see the whole film, I think from the perspective that I've gained just from watching the woman talk, looks like a lot of stuff is unresolved there. And I hope the film does go into some more detail about that side of it. Because I think if you're making a film where you have someone who is of, of a clear level of vulnerability, uh, you have a duty of care to, to not only um, uh, extract the story that's going to make your film interesting, but you have a, a, have a duty in front and behind the camera to make sure that that person is cared for, that that person is treated with compassion, and that that person understands the risks that come with sharing such intimate details so publicly. Because if you're doing that from a place of vulnerability and you're driven by your vulnerability and trauma, then uh, all of that public attention, and it isn't all going to be validatory, uh, then that's going to... Uh, trigger you more, that's going to create a pretext for potentially more destructive behaviours. And, and, and I think that this is one of the big problems that I have with catharsis culture, where we are encouraged to almost commodify, in a sense, painful experiences uh, that have happened in our lives. We're encouraged to run with whatever meaning we've made of them, 
even when we've not been given any guidance or sought any guidance about what actually has happened. Because sometimes there's what's happened and then there's the story we tell ourselves about what's happened, isn't there? If I walk in this room right now and you're standing behind the door and I accidentally open the door and it hits you, you experience the physical pain of the door hitting you. But if I walk in and I deliberately hit you with the door, you experience the physical pain associated with being hit with the door. Uh, but you also experience the compounding pain of, of wondering why did I do that deliberately, of speculating what was my motive, what was my agenda, what is it that I don't like about you. And sometimes when we are trying to make sense of trauma from a place of trauma, then we can we can draw uh, conclusions that may actually cause us more harm and help us and, 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 and prevent us from recovering from that. I think of my own experiences early in life with my mother, uh, who it's her 22nd anniversary today of her passing. So I've been reflecting on that. And there was a point in my life where I was just convinced that she was the worst person in the world. She she developed alcoholism at a young age and this really impaired her ability to function normally and this had an impact on the quality of our relationship and, and how I was raised when I was in her care. And, and I remember when I started drinking that negative story, I told myself, was really fuel on the flames of not only my trauma, but my alcoholism. And if anybody had tried to intervene and say, listen, your mother was a complicated person with good points and not so good points. Uh, and you cannot assume that because there was negative experiences that those were all intentional or that those were driven by some uh, nefarious force deep within your mother. And that actually uh, she, 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 was, she came to be a chaotic alcoholic who was controlled by an addictive mind and that this led to her letting people down around her and that I should have some compassion for that, not least because I ended up becoming one of those alcoholics myself. So there are so many interesting areas uh, just looking at this clip where many things come up for me around trauma culture and how sometimes we we are encouraged to make a meaning of our trauma and then kind of wear it like a badge. And, and it's implied that there should be no scrutiny of the story we tell ourselves about what happened. There should be no scrutiny of how the trauma might be manifesting in our behaviours and attitudes. That somehow because we've experienced trauma, we're a protected group, we're beyond reproach. And that it's unhealthy for us to be triggered by people asking us questions about why we think certain things, why we feel certain things, why we're sharing certain things. When in truth, that might not always be the most supportive or kindest or compassionate way to, to deal with that. I wonder what people think out there, especially in the social media age. Have you ever shared something online and then maybe regretted uh, the level of detail that you went into? other traumas in your life and feel it feel free to share as much or as little as as, as you like but obviously uh, bear in mind that it will be subject to other people being able to see it but other areas where you know at one point in your life you felt a traumatic event or a certain relationship or event that happened meant one thing and then through growth or development or gaining insight or guidance you made new meaning of it and has there ever been a point where you sense that by giving people more and more information, it might help them to draw a more favourable conclusion of you. Uh, and then subsequently that turned out not to be the case. Because if I scroll through my Twitter feed, particularly in Scotland, I see people talking at events about their traumatic events. I see people talking at conferences about things that's happened to them. I see them being applauded. I see them being celebrated. And I think that's important but also think the people who are giving people those platforms need to understand a little bit more some of the stuff that I'm saying here because there's a lot more to trauma and recovering from trauma than just telling the story that you've told yourself about what happened and that the recovery process is ongoing, potentially lifelong, that we need to be open-minded and willing uh, to make new meaning where it's appropriate and also to, to resist the impulse sometimes to overshare because sometimes the thing that we're oversharing now might be something in five, ten years that we look back on and we think, man, I don't really feel the same way about that anymore. Things have changed for me. But in a sense, part of you will always be trapped in that self-portrait. Like, share, comment, share the shit out of this. 
Thanks for supporting the platform. We have some news coming up uh, about how we're going to be taking the podcast live to the Fringe for a week. We'll get the dates out to you. The tickets and all of that will be available. It'll be in the evening as well, so hopefully more of you will be able to come. But all of that in good time. I'm on tour right now if you're interested in catching up. Uh, some of my dates, I've got uh, Greenock, I've got Kirkcaldy, Inverness, Oban. They're all coming up soon, Paisley. There are limited tickets available for all of this. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it's pretty much a sellout tour. Thanks to all of you guys for supporting it. You can check out the tour dates on my Twitter at Loki Scottish Rap. It's the pinned tweet right at the top. Just hit the link tree and you can see what's available. Have a great day, folks. Thank you. Thank you.